Iberdrola, one of the world's largest energy companies. In 2000, Iberdrola anticipated the global energy transition. Today, Iberdrola is leader in renewable energies. We have invested over $100 billion in renewable energies, networks and storage, becoming the utility of the future. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kulaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times Live Conversation Series, Times Talks. Welcome to tonight's Times Talks event, produced in collaboration with the UN Global Compact and exploring the most urgent challenge facing our planet, climate change. I want to give a special thanks to tonight's sponsor, Iberdrola. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Carlos Saye, Senior Vice President of Energy Policies and Climate Change at Iberdrola. Carlos? Thank you, well, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for all for coming uh, to see this thought-provoking event that we have launched with distinguished panel who are each playing an important role in the fight against climate change. Iberdrola is proud to sponsor this event during what is a crucial week here in New York for agreeing on a roadmap to deliver on the uh, Paris Agreement. The United Nations Secretary General called for administrations, civil society, and companies to come to New York with concrete plans for action because the time to talk has passed. At Iberdrola, we pride ourselves of taking action. Following the Kyoto Protocol, we made radical change in our business model. As fair movers, 20 years ago, we started a process of closing down our coal and oil plants, innovating and investing in low carbon technologies. Now, we have become a world leader in wind power and smart grid technology. We have demonstrated that betting on the green economy is not only good for the planet and citizens, but also good for our shareholders. We have created thousands of direct sustainable jobs and helped others to create even more jobs across the clean energy sector. It is clear to us at Iberdrola that the cost of decarbonization it's much lower than not decarbonizing the economy. There is positive momentum growing. But we know, as scientists and youth are saying, that we need even more ambition and much more urgent actions. I am sure we will hear plenty of examples from the panel this evening. Over the past few years, it has been particularly inspiring to see young people all around the world unite to take action to, on climate change. Young people are having a real influence on the debates, and their united voice will spur many into action. We are very pleased to be part of this first ever New York Times Talks event to take place during the week, uh, the Climate Week. Thanks again for coming, and now I'm pleased to, to turn to, to talk to introduce tonight's panels. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, and now on to our program. Moderating tonight's discussion is Sumini Sengupta, New York Times international climate reporter, a George Polk award-winning correspondent. She's reported from South Asia, West Africa, the Middle East, and many places in between. Her first book, The End of Karma, Hope and Fury Among India's Young, was published in 2016. Joining Samini are our panelists, climate scientist Dr. Kate Marvell, Secretary General of Amnesty International Kumi Naidu, New York City student and climate activist, Alexandria Villasenor, and Luis Alfonso de Alba, special envoy of the Secretary General to, for the 2019 UN Climate Action Summit. Please join me in giving them all a very warm welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for coming out. I'm going to jump right in instead of um, taking a lot of time to introduce our, our panelists because it's really, it's just an impressive panel that, uh, that we have here. So we are, this is where we are in this moment. The, the, there's more carbon in the atmosphere than ever before. 
the world is hotter than ever before. It's getting hotter faster. We've seen many of the consequences in recent months and years. We've also seen a surge of activism, not just in New York last week, but in Kampala and in Manila and in Berlin mm -hmm. and Rio. Um, and most recently, we've seen the United Nations Secretary General and his climate envoy, Luis Alfonso de Alba, really trying to push presidents and prime ministers to get their act together and make this rapid change to ratchet down emissions. So that's the moment we're in. It's, really a, it's a really pivotal moment to be having this conversation. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Kate Marvel. You wrote last week a very um, influential essay that began with the lines, we are, I promise you, not doomed. And you know, when I first read that, you know, I, I thought, really? I mean, what, what are the choices before us right now, given where we are? What does the science tell us with certainty, with some certainty? And what does the science not tell us? I think the science supports urgency, but I don't think the science supports despair. Um, we know, as you mentioned, that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. We know that we've been putting quite a lot of it into the atmosphere. We know that the temperature is rising. It's about a degree Celsius hotter now than it was before the Industrial Revolution. And we know the consequences of that. We know that warm air holds more water vapor, so we expect more downpours. We also know that warmer air is thirstier air, so we expect more evaporation from the surface and more droughts. We expect more heat waves. We expect stronger hurricanes and higher storm surges. And all of these things, to some extent, we're already seeing. And I think the magnitude of the problem is really large. We have to cut emissions. We are facing even more danger. But the thing is, you hear a lot that we have 12 years, or is it 11 years now? We have some number of years to act before everything is, is lost. And I don't think the science supports putting a deadline on that, because it's, I think you should think about climate change not as a cliff that we go off, but as a slope that we slide down. And we can always choose to turn around and begin that really sort of mm -hmm. long, slow climb back up the slope. Yeah, that's a really um, stark metaphor. You know, it's not a cliff, it's a, it's a slope. I want to come back to that 2040 um, thing a little bit later. I want to ask you, Alexandra Villasenor, you are 14 years old, you're an eighth grader, and you've spent 41 Fridays uh, striking in front of the United Nations. In winter, in summer, in rain, you've been out there. Can you tell us quickly, you know, what prompted you to, to do that? And when you were inside the United Nations this week, yesterday, what did you make of what you heard? Yes, well, first of all, thank you for having me so much tonight. It's very great to be here today. And so my name is Alexandria, and I have been on Climate Strike every Friday. And really what had made me want to get involved and take action was I was visiting family back in Northern California, where I was born and raised when the Paradise Fire broke out. And so Paradise quickly became the worst wildfire in California history. Many people died and many homes were destroyed. And so since I was so close to this fire, I had gotten a lot of the smoke in my home, and especially the smoke would be seeping into my house. We, I'd have to roll up wet towels and put them under windows and doors. Um, people would be handing out face masks to keep out the smoke from breathing in all the smoke inhalation. But what, was I, what I'd noticed was that the smoke wasn't keeping out the particles that were very harmful. And I think that that was one of the first things that I realized about how we are so unprepared for all of these disasters from the climate crisis. And so really, because I have asthma, and it was very, it was inflaming my asthma, making me nauseous, my family had to send me back to New York City early for my safety. And at that point, I was very upset. I started to really research wildfires, mm -hmm. and I started to see the connection between wildfires and the climate crisis. And that made me want to do something, take some sort of action, and I didn't really know what to do. 
until after seeing Greta Thunberg speak at COP24. And seeing her, she had really empowered me, and I finally knew what I had to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me take my first form of activism and start striking. And so leading up to the United Nations Climate Summit, it's been a very anticipated moment. And so I know from the youth's perspective, we have seen our world leaders come together for big moments like this, but have seen no action at all. And so what happened yesterday with the United Nations Climate Action Summit is that me and Greta Thunberg and 14 other children from all around the world, and you can look at all the names of the children at childrenversclimatecrisis.org, and we had filed a complaint to the Committee on the Rights of the Child saying the world leaders are violating our rights as children because of their inaction on the climate crisis. And this is because we have waited and waited for world leaders to do something, and they haven't done what they were supposed to do. Mm. So this is, um, this is a, a legal brief filed under the, the Global Convention on the Rights of the Child. Exactly. We are taking all these world leaders to international court for violating our rights as children because in, um, because in Article 6 on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it says that it states that we have an inherent right to life. And right now, the climate crisis is threatening that, and it's threatening our future and all of our livelihoods all around the world. Ambassador, you've spent the last many months trying to cajole and push world leaders into doing more and doing it faster. From your perspective, what was the good, bad, and ugly of yesterday's summit? Well, let me, let me start by highlighting that uh, we have uh, invited to participate in this summit not only governments, also civil society, youth representatives. And we have worked in the preparation of this summit with the, all this uh, group of stakeholders. And I was very happy to see them inside the building. We have uh, Alejandra. Alexandra was part of it. We had the first ever youth summit on Saturday. And we also uh, included a segment, a dialogue with, uh, between the Secretary General and the youth at the beginning of the summit. We had a large participation of uh, business sector, civil society, indigenous people. They were all on the stage, and they were all on the stage at the same time. I think that the message of in inclusiveness that the Secretary General uh, sent through this format was very, very innovative and very powerful. I think we had very high level of representation coming from all those stakeholders in the, in the, in the, in the room, and a number of important uh, commitments or actions, including actions uh, proposed by the youth, uh, actions proposed by governments and some coalitions that were formed. It is obvious that we are still far from what we need to, to achieve, but I think it has been extremely important to have this opportunity to bring all the stakeholders together and develop what I hope is going to be a next stage in the fight against climate change, one that will concentrate on action. No more speeches, no more statements, no more uh, meetings at the United Nations if it's not to take stock of what has been done and what needs to be done in, in addition to that. So for you, you were happy to see so many people there. You were happy to see the diversity. Tell us what you think were the concrete actions that, uh, that came out of it. What were, the, what were your top two or three? And what didn't come out mm -hmm. of it that you well, had I, hoped would? I think you, you saw movement, which is very positive from governments, it's still not all the governments. You need to remember that the, the obligations for governments are to present new NDCs next year, not, not now. But we saw a, a, a number of governments which came already with an announcement, concrete announcement, or commitments to present the new NDCs in the very near future. NDCs, nationally determined, nationally determined contributions. contributions. These are their voluntary pledges on what they will do to ratchet down emissions. Exactly. Okay. And they have also uh, embrace the goal of 1.5 degrees as, as the, the <coughs> sorry as the goal for the international community. That means that we need to get to, to carbon neutrality before the, the 2050. But more importantly, I think those countries that uh, came there yesterday have seen what leadership looked like, 
who is taking the, 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 the first measures, which are the governments, which are the actors, which are committing already, and I hope that that will have a very powerful influence on the rest, because they all need to come back. They saw the business sector coming with very concrete proposals, with uh, uh, arguments which are very powerful, that they are doing this not only because they care about the health and the human beings, but also because it is becoming reasonable, economically reasonable, uh, because it is accessible, because the transition will bring benefits uh, to, the, to the economy and to the, to the society. We saw groups of countries, the most weak, the most vulnerable countries, the LDCs, the, the, the seeds, that uh, took the lead. They were the most ambitious and they came with concrete proposals. Obviously, the response has to be a response on which we will bring the knowledge and the resources for them to achieve their purposes. Cominario, we know that the largest emitters did not make any new ambitious commitments yesterday. Um, what was your what was your takeaway, especially given the Friday activism that you saw on the streets all over the world? What did you make of what happened yesterday? Well, I think Ambassador Elva is right that we had some new commitments that suggest that the voices of our children have been listened to at mm -hmm. one level, mm -hmm. that people recognize urgency mm -hmm. and so on. Although the proof of the pudding is in the eating, mm -hmm. and actually when you look at it, the scale of the commitments that have made do not get us anywhere near a 1.5 mm -hmm. degree world. Let's be very clear about that. Um, there is, um, you know, there are some big elephants in the room mm -hmm. that we are not addressing because it's not simply a question of moving from oil, coal and gas to wind, solar and so on. But we also have to look at questions of the very, very unequal consumption patterns we have in the world, mm -hmm. as well as the deepening inequality that we have within countries, because the climate crisis is in part a consumption crisis, mm -hmm. right? If you look at the unevil, skewed ways of how people consume, what they consume and so on. So overall, uh, I think the spirit, for those of you who saw Greta Thunberg's speech, yesterday was one that still mm -hmm. says our leaders are not where we need them to be. And yesterday I was at the Secretary General's lunch with the private sector and I was asked to offer some comments. And uh, we were given like a menu of why we are not making, you know, progress. And, you know, it was technology is not there, finance is not there, you know, public opinion is not there. And all of them are factors. But three factors were left out. The failure of governments to provide meaningful regulation that holds companies to account. The second factor is corporate greed. And the third factor is the intensive lobbying from corporations, particularly fossil fuel companies, who spend hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of falsifying the science and the public uh, conversation around it. So I just want to say, <laughs> in the end, I think I'm less optimistic about what we've mm -hmm. achieved. Uh, and, and, and you know, we just have to recognize that this fight is not about saving the planet. Let me, let me just put it that way. Why I say that? We continue on the path that we are. We erode our water resources, our soil resources, can't produce food. The end result is we'll be gone. The planet will still be here. <laughs> Good news is once we become extinct, the forests will recover, the oceans will replenish, <laughs> and so on. So, so understand that the struggle that we're involved in is the struggle to secure our children and their children's future. And, and let me just say, on this question about how bad is it, are we out of time, and so on, I want to go with your take on it, that the window of opportunity is small, but it's there, and we need mm -hmm. to act. But let's be very clear. For the people where I come from, climate change has already taken thousands and thousands of lives. For the people of Kiribati, where in, in the South Pacific, where they're having to shift the entire country, the, the population, it's too late. For the people of Bangladesh in coastal regions where sea level rise is already pushing people and uh, uh, contaminating the soil with seawater and the Kandu agriculture. So for very many communities that didn't 
play a big role in the emissions that we have, they are paying the first and most brutal price. And I want to conclude by mm -hmm. saying an uncomfortable thing. That uh, Philip Alston, who is a UN Special Rapporteur mm -hmm. on Poverty and Inequality, he said what we are dealing with is a problem of climate apartheid. Mm -hmm. right? That if you look at which parts of the world historically created the problem and which parts of the world are suffering, it gives you a very uncomfortable racial picture. Right? And so speaking from the Global South perspective, for many of our people, it's too late. The Syrian uh, crisis, the fingerprints of climate was there. The migration crisis you're seeing, the fingerprints of climate impacts are, are there. So depending on which perspective you look at it, if we are losing lives of our people already, as far as I'm concerned, it is too late for those people. And we need to keep those people's memories in our hearts as we accelerate progress because those lives did not need to be lost and the lives that will be lost next month, the following year and so on, we need to start putting urgency so that we can reverse that trend. Dr. Kate Marvel, I want to come back to what you uh, signaled a little earlier, 2040. We hear a lot that this needs to happen by 2040. We also hear um, that we need to keep global temperatures from rising above 1.5 degrees from pre-industrial levels. Can you break down these two numbers? What does that mean, 1.5 degrees, and what does 2040 mean? In my view, what those numbers are are shorthand for what is true, which is that our choices in this next decade and our choices tomorrow are really going to determine the planet that we live on. Um, so I, I quibble with the use of hard deadlines because nature does not think in Fahrenheit or Celsius. Nature doesn't know what a degree is. What I care about are the people who live on the planet because, as Kumi pointed out, the planet will survive us. And as, as was pointed out, there are millions of people already suffering from climate change. So I really, really quibble with the framing, we have 12 years to avoid climate change because we have not avoided climate change. It's already here. But I also worry that that framing can lead to nihilism, saying there is no way that we can possibly achieve this target, so let's not even try. And that is the thing that I think is really, really important to confront, because the science does not support nihilism. The science says that our actions in the next decade matter a lot for the planet. So from each of your perspectives, what needs to happen next? Mm -hmm. Next steps from your perspective. What really needs to happen next is to get our world leaders to listen to the science, and that's what the youth movement is going to continue to do. We are going to continue mobilizing and doing that civil disobedience every single Friday. And with the complaint that was filed, I hope that children all around the world also realize that their rights are being violated and, violated and they need to stand up and fight back as well. And so once world leaders can finally listen to the science and start acting on it, that's what we need to do next, is they need to start taking action for our future. What was the conversation you were hearing yesterday after all the, the speeches at the UN? What, what, was the, what was the vibe among young people and youth organizers from around the world? The conversation that happened after the United Nations Climate Summit was mostly we were looking at Greta Thunberg's words. We were watching what she had said to our world leaders and it had very much, we had resonated with that because we felt the same way after watching this whole year go by with the youth movement, but they have still not acted. And so we all had very much felt disappointed, but we were, we are still very hopeful with the continued action that we're going to take that they will do something. And so it was just a moment that was a lead up but if they do not take action, if our world leaders don't act, it will just make us feel more empowered and it will fuel what we feel and it will make us want to take action even more. So next steps from your perspective, Ambassador Dalba, what needs to happen next? Well, for us, the, the summit was just the beginning of a process. It's certainly not the end. If we have focus on the event in identifying a number of actions, concrete action, commitment by different stakeholders, our obligation is to do a follow-up of those actions, and not only to 
summarize what everybody has committed, but to do serious follow-up, which means in some cases uh, to monitor and highlight the importance of doing things. In some other cases, actively helping the countries to achieve or the companies or the stakeholders uh, to achieve their goals. And we have targets. And mm -hmm. our immediate target is December this year, which is going to be, to be the COP in Santiago de Chile, on which the Secretary General has already committed to attend and to report on the implementation of this summit. Okay, Not so COP commitment. is Conference of Parties. This is where every party that has uh, signed on to the Paris Agreement, they come for annual talks, they're meeting in Santiago, Chile. Their deadline mm -hmm. is 2020 to say, well, actually, here's what more we are yeah. willing to do. Yeah. Because even if every country meets its voluntary targets under the Paris Agreement, mm -hmm. Or the world as a whole is not going to get to that 1.5 degrees that Kate was not describing. Yet. Much more is yes, required. But, but this is exactly the value of a summit. The COP, or the Conference of the Parties, normally gathers the ministers of our environment. And the work that the Secretary General is directly related to leaders, because we need other sectors to be fully involved, ministers of finance, ministers of energy, ministers of so <coughs> sorry, okay. social development. The work needs to continue. He also needs to continue to ask specific things to happen from some governments. We need to put an end to the use of coal. And he has asked everybody not to build new plants, coal plants, after 2020. And he will continue to do that, to reduce the subsidies of fossil fuels. He will continue to do that. He will continue to actively campaign for partnerships to be built, to be able to, to keep the door open of the United Nations for all stakeholders, because something on which we may disagree a little bit is that there is an historic responsibility on the developed countries, obviously. But there is an increasing concern about a number of developing countries that are becoming already major emitters. And we also need to work with them to avoid that to continue to, to happen. Okay. Emissions continue in India, in China, in Mexico, in Brazil, in South Africa. You just named in, two of the biggest coal yeah, burning countries. Indonesia, in China. Vietnam. There are many, which Nigeria, who may still have a possibility to keep their emissions very low. And that's also very important. Kuminaru, concretely, what needs to happen next? We need to do two things. One is recognize that if history teaches us anything, those with power do not change systems without pressure, right? So, and if history teaches us anything, whether it was slavery, whether it's women's right to vote, whether it was the civil rights in the United States, apartheid in South Africa, those struggles only move forward when decent women and men stood up and said, enough <coughs> is enough and no more. We better put our lines, their lives on the line if necessary, we prepared to go to prison if necessary. That's the kind of resistance that we have to mount right now. And the only people who seem to get that on scale are young people, sadly. Mm -hmm. right? uh, the second thing we need to do is for each and every one of us, including myself, by the way, to recognize that we are all funders of fossil fuels mm -hmm. if we have a bank account. right? Because if you have a bank account, do you know where your bank is putting your money into? Right? So we don't have any more time or sufficient time to go after every company that's promoting fossil fuels or deforestation and so on. We, uh, I used to be the head of uh, Greenpeace and during that time you know, we were very successful in getting companies within three, four months, wage a campaign. But it's hard work, one company after the other, we just don't have that time. So what we need to do is follow the money. If there's one lever of power that we have is to follow the money and, and try and shut the flow of capital at the source. So for example, if each and every one of us here yeah, want to think about something that we can do, we have power, whether you have $5 or $5 million in your bank account, you are a stakeholder in your bank, so we need to look at all the financial institutions. They're all different and complicated and so on. But we have to bring people into the participating in actually stopping investments that makes the problem worse. And on the other hand, we have to add our voice towards where investments should go 
and the investments should be going into energy efficiency, new uh, clean energy, uh, as well as more innovative uh, solutions to everything from how we do agriculture, which is 20% of emissions, by the way, uh, as well as you know aviation, clean aviation, full fuel, and so on. So we have to work out ways to shift the flow of capital from climate destroying economic activity to climate protecting and rehabilitating eco uh, economic activity. Dr. K. Marvel, from your perspective as a scientist, what is next concretely? Um, I'm actually going to disagree a little bit with Alexandria because she says listen to the science, listen to the scientists. And as a scientist, I say listen to the teenagers because, <laughs> <laughs> because as a scientist, I can tell you what happens when you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I'm a physicist. That's my job. And I can tell you what the consequences are if you stop doing that or if you take it out. But the systems that we have built that are responsible for putting the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, putting the methane in the atmosphere, putting the nitrous oxide in the atmosphere, the systems that we've built are kind of above my pay grade. And I get really annoyed. The New York Times is not a culprit, I don't think, but I get really annoyed when I see these headlines that are like, scientists are worried about global warming. And I'm kind of like, where do the rest of you live? You know, do you have another planet? So I think we really need to move away from this notion that climate change is a purely scientific problem. Obviously, I think science has a very important role to play, but I think we need to recognize that climate change is something that encompasses all parts of society. Mm -hmm. And so the concrete thing that I would say as a scientist is we all need to talk about it. It can't just be scientists. It can't just be activists. Because it's going to affect, if it hasn't affected you already, it's going to affect you. You know, you all travel and talk to all kinds of people, right? And maybe once in a while, you might run into someone who says, climate change isn't happening, it's not real, or it's far off in the future, or it, it's too expensive to fix. Do you recall a conversation where you've managed to move the needle a bit, where you've managed to persuade someone to see it differently? And any of you can jump in and uh, answer this. When I started at uh, Greenpeace in 2009, there was a I looked at all the fossil fuel companies uh, to see which one we might be able to shift first. And um, there was a company called Enel in Italy, the largest uh, energy utility, second largest in Europe, and the sixth largest in the world. They had eight court cases against us for our activists who occupied and shut down coal plants, and we had about three court cases against them. We said, let's keep talking, because I had made an assessment that the leadership and the nature of the company gave us the best possibility. So we worked behind the scenes, making the arguments that not only this was right for the environment, but that actually it was right for the company in the long term, and that if the company actually got ahead of the curve, mm -hmm. they were actually going to be one of the successful energy companies. Basically, oil, coal, and gas companies, in, in essence, are energy companies. Right? We don't want to kill any of those companies. We've been saying to them for a long time, change how you, what energy you deliver and how you deliver it. Right? The so, fuel. Change the fuel. Yeah. So in the end of the day, uh, people were saying, no, we won't change it. On 20, 2014, uh, sorry, March 2015, before Paris, uh, I get called to come and visit the CEO of NL. We go in there and he says, you all were right, we were wrong. Uh, we are going to make the following changes. We want to announce publicly next week that as of today we will not invest one cent in oil, coal, gas or nuclear. Secondly, we will shut down everything by 2030 and we will take responsibility for shutting down. We won't just sell it to another you know, company somewhere that continues with the industry and that all our new investments will go into renewable energies energy efficiency, as well as um, you know, storage and batteries and so on. Today, they have one of the best balance sheets of any company in the energy sector. Right? So they made the changes. In fact, 
uh, Bloomberg News, sorry to mention another carrier, uh, <laughs> carried an article interview with me and they, they ran it. I was still the head of Greenpeace then and they said meet renewable energies odd couple. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so, so basically we need to continue. Just to be clear, the industry sometimes likes to say that we in civil society are not willing to engage in dialogue and so on. I want to tell you that's not true. We are always in, willing to engage in dialogue. Okay. However, we're not willing to engage in cosmetic dialogue mm -hmm. where we know exactly that they are just wanting to get a photo op with us so that they can say they talk to Amnesty International and that we are in dialogue. So right now, I think that there are many examples of CEOs of big companies wanting to do the right thing. And I should just say that one of the reasons that some of these CEOs want to do the right thing, especially those that are in the second or third marriages with young kids. kids. Uh, they are getting it from their young partners and from their own children at home. Mm -hmm. right? No, seriously. And, and on one occasion, one spouse actually called me and gave me good intelligence before I went to negotiate with the husband. <laughs> uh, yes, Alexandria, do you have a, something to, to recollect where you think you moved the needle, changed someone's mind? Yes, so I will admit something to all of you. I have a climate denier relative. I'm sure we all have one. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> and so what I found out is that with the personal connection and that personal conversation, it can very much change people's minds. So my re that marriage, um, relative by marriage, is seeing my activism. And so she's starting to pay attention, and she's starting to really her mindset is slowly changing. Hmm. And so, for example, as well, you can see more of this by my organization, Earth Uprising, really focuses on peer-to-peer -peer climate education to really mobilize students to take direct action. And so when it's that peer-to-peer -peer conversation, you can start to change people's minds and you can start to make them feel more interested and more involved. And so I could do that with my relative by marriage. And so I can see with that personal conversation it can very much change people's opinions. Can you take us into one of your conversations with your peers? Not necessarily to persuade them, but I wonder what your everyday conversations with your peers are like. What are they asking you? Well, a lot of my everyday conversations with my peers is I usually tell them what I'm doing with activism and what I'm really pushing for and the climate action I'm pushing for. And so from that, they get interested and they're like, I wonder why, why she's doing that. And so they'll start to really research themselves as well. And so for example, I have a friend who just ran for student body president. And so she had had this plan to eliminate zero waste at lunchtime. And so it's that conversation that's really making her pay attention in their mm -hmm. own ways. So I have my friends becoming an activist in different types of ways, which is so important because the conversation in just a year has changed so much more. The conversation in just a year, mm -hmm. yeah. You were telling us, um, you were telling me backstage, Kate, that yesterday, no, Friday, you sat um, with a sign that said, I'm a scientist, ask me anything, right? With your mm -hmm. child asleep <laughs> on you. And you said mm -hmm. that the young people came and asked you a variety of questions. Share some of that. Um, I mean, I got a lot more questions than I was expecting. Um, yeah. As kind of a cranky old lady, you don't really expect teenagers <laughs> to come up and talk to you. <laughs> what were they asking you? <laughs> um, and you know, I got I got some questions saying I saw this on TV or I saw this on the internet. And whenever anybody prefaces something with I saw this so on sweet. the internet, you're like, oh my god. <laughs> um, and you know, a lot of a lot of times people were were genuinely concerned. You know, I, I read this, I heard this, is this true? And generally the answer was no. Um, but for me that was a big shock, like, oh, those things are still mm. floating around out there, um, including some sort of conspiracy theories that I'd never even heard of. But I think mm. the, the number one question I got was something like, are we, are we gonna be okay? Um, is there any hope? Can we, can we have any optimism? And I think the answer to that is, you can have hope if you make it. Hmm. That's very powerful. We've, you know, I hear from some of you, from some people, that this moment, you hope, will be a turning point in climate action. For all of the reasons that we've talked about. But especially Kumi Naidu, and to you, Ambassador Dalba, haven't we 
seen moments like this before. You know, when there's been a tremendous surge of civic activism mm -hmm. about something, whether it's the anti-war movement mm -hmm. or uh, anti-apartheid or civil rights or even environmental issues. Mm -hmm. Is there really anything that tells you that we are at a turning point? And, and if so, what would, be the, what would be the proof? Well, keeping with climate change, I can tell you that 10 years ago, I was preparing for the Cancun conference, and I can compare with today. First of all, there is much more knowledge and much more optimism, believe it or not. Mm. Uh, there are many more actors engaging. There's still uh, misinformation. We still need to clarify what is, is needed. Uh, there is a better, better understanding also, not only on the needs to reduce emissions, but to tackle with the effects of climate change. We have not talked about adaptation and the need to respond to the most vulnerable. And it's not only the most vulnerable countries, but the most vulnerable people within our... our I've been in meetings with uh, indigenous peoples who have taken very seriously the fight against climate change. I have been in the very poor areas on which they are looking into the possibility of having a small uh, grids with solar ele electricity as the only way they can get electricity mm. in the short term. So there is, there is a, a optimism. Okay. It, it's a little bit ironic because we are at a point on which we are we have clarity that much more is going to be needed compared to what we think we thought that it was needed 10 years ago. But there is, I think, much more, uh, I would say, multi-stakeholder movement. There is less political will today than the one we had in Paris. You know? uh, there are some countries that are lagging behind. There's but less political will among world leaders some. than than among some world leaders. Yes than four years ago. It was just yes. four years ago. But the others... When there was a lot of hope as well. But right? the rest... People were saying turning point four yeah. years ago. But yesterday, you don't saw, you don't saw, uh, saw anyone taking an excuse for others to act. They were all coming individually to say what they are committing to do. This is a very positive sign. We have gone from a process on which there was a huge divide between developed and developing countries and a huge bargaining uh, with the rules of consensus. Everybody had to agree, etc. Very slow processes of negotiation to a point on which every single government, local government, federal government, every single enterprise, every single person can be held accountable because we all have the possibility and the responsibility to contribute to the solution. This is. Amazing. We have a very long way to go, but we know what needs to be done. It, yes, I would just quickly. add yep. the, the other positive uh, factor is the technological advancements we've seen. Technology. And the fact that, for example, solar and wind for the last five years, and if you've got money to invest, don't invest necessarily because of the climate. The return on investment right now is better in solar and and wind, we're seeing mm. it, right? mm -hmm. because the technology is coming. And, and by the way, solar, wind, and other clean uh, uh, energy options mm -hmm. don't have the same level of subsidies from taxpayers that our governments give to the fossil fuel industry, mm -hmm. which still run into we the trillions of, of, of dollars in, when you, mm -hmm. you know, on a global basis uh, put it together. But for all those reasons, um, I think why this is a tipping point mm -hmm. is the fact that we now have new alliances that are emerging that we've never seen before. Let me give you one example. You know, in the old days, people used to talk about red-green tensions, meaning the tensions between labor and environmentalism. Mm -hmm. Right now, Amnesty International, together with others, led a summit here, bringing together the non-environmental actors in the world. and. Alexandra mm -hmm. gave a wonderful closing address to that conference. Uh, and we now have come out with the action plan. Mm -hmm. And Ambassador Alva opened it. Actually, he opened it and she closed it. <laughs> uh, and, Indeed, a pleasure. And, and we have a very clear agenda of how we can bring the human rights movement. So trade unions and NGOs and, and, and 
are working together. Mm -hmm. Because you know the most powerful single line of climate activism did not come from an environmentalist, came from a trade union leader. Mm -hmm. Sharon Burroughs, the leader of the first woman to lead the world trade union movement, the ITUC, said several years ago in a meeting we had with Ban Ki-moon, he said, Mr. Secretary General, you might wonder why me as a trade unionist, I'm so committed to uh, climate because when I saw the fight for jobs, she said, the reason is there are no jobs on a dead planet. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's one new thing. The other thing is faith leaders. Today we are seeing faith leaders participating on a, a scale uh, never before. I would say that the silence of faith leaders on the question of the environment has been deafening hmm. to a large extent historically because if you believe in God, then God didn't only create us. God created the mountains, the oceans, the forests and so on. So they are coming to the party in significant... Yeah, in North America, just to give you an example, the North American Muslim leadership just issued a fatwa, which is a legal, uh, sorry, a religious edict, where they've actually said to all Muslims in North America, don't invest in fossil mm -hmm. fuels because... Okay. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so there's, there's a lot of momentum. And, but I have to say, the thing that gives me the sense that it's a tipping point is what our children have done. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's amazing what Alexandra and Greta and the other kids... By the way, there are kids in Uganda, in South Africa, in India, in... You know, it's not just kids in the rich parts of the world, even though that's where it started. And there's something about young people participating in the way they are participating. Their ability to appeal to the moral conscience of society is much more powerful than, you know... What do you say? Old, I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to use a word that starts with Andre F, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, old people like us. <laughs> uh, you know, it has a different kind of mobilizing, you know, potential. And, and just to say, I was a 15-year-old activist in the anti-apartheid struggle. And I would argue that what shifted the dial in terms mm -hmm. of movement towards liberating ourselves from apartheid, it was when young people in high schools together with university students actually joined the struggle in large terms, were willing to make sacrifices, uh, and so on. So I, for all of those reasons, I think we're at the tipping point. And of course, the tipping point is also because there is a deep sense that we are fast running out of time, mm. because that's what the scientists say. I want to fast to forward to 2040, right? Just for the sake of argument, this is the year that, according to the IPCC, we have to start bending the curve very sharply, right, by this year. To you all, what does 2040 look like? You know, what's going to be really different about the way we live in 2040? Where we live, how we get around? Dr. Marvel, you want to start? Um, well, I hope that investing in fossil fuels will be seen like investing in tobacco. Um, I hope there will be a certain stigma um, attached to it. I also hope that, as you mentioned, it'll just be more profitable to um, be funding energy sources that aren't fossil fuels. Mm. Um, and I'm not, I'm not minimizing the amount of effort it's going to take to get there. I don't think in 2040 we're all going to be able to relax and, and rest on our laurels and just watch everything um, go. I think we're going to need to keep fighting. I think this is a a lifelong struggle. Okay, so very concretely, 2040, fossil fuel investment has a stigma attached to it. What do you see in 2040? How old are you going to be in 2040? In 2040, I will be... 25. Yes, 25. Right? Yeah, 25. <laughs> um, and in that year... What's going to be different? I really hope that, looking on the bright side, I hope that we do get off of fossil fuels and that we are living on renewable energy. I hope that we live in a planet where we are in harmony with this earth that we call our home. And I also want to see that we start focusing on restoration, so habitat restoration and ocean cleanup. And that's really what I want to see. I don't want to see my generation really having to change every aspect of our life to really adapt to the climate crisis, which is the trajectory that we're on right now. And so I really with the youth activism, I'm looking towards the bright side and what we can achieve instead of what we are trying to prevent. Hmm. 
Ambassador, what does 2040 look like? I won't ask you how old you will be. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind. <laughs> no, let me, let me tell you that I will share a story with my sons. My youngest son is 20 years old. And he only asked me not to talk about him and, mm -hmm. and betray his, tr his trust. And he told me, talk about yourself. Don't talk about 2040, 2050. Talk about 2019, 2020. The quality of air is terrible in many cities. With quality many, of the air. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just the air quality. Yeah. Look at the number of people that is dying because of the quality of air in different cities. I come from Mexico, and Mexico City faced a serious problem. It has managed the problem to some extent, but it's still terrible. I don't know if you have uh, an opportunity to visit the, 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 the spots or the pots that we uh, put in there the garden. There were these the tents garden. on the UN grounds. Oh, yeah, yeah. And on there which were you can four cities. Yeah. Inside, they had simulated the air in each of the cities. So the first one was London, then it was New Delhi, then it was Beijing and Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. And the artist who had done this had uh, worked with perfumers mm -hmm. in each of these cities. So that's what mm -hmm. you're referring to. So, yeah. much better health. New jobs. 2040, much better health. Yeah. Right? And, and okay. better jobs. Think about what the job of a miner is, looking into, into the, the quality of life of those people. The opportunities that a, a transformational change touches the yeah. whole economy. It would be wonderful. I, I, I dream of uh, having uh, electric transportation. Many countries, developed countries, already are moving into that, but, but it's still very slow. I, I, I look into innovation. I look into technologies that will make a much better uh, life. Hmm. And I still enjoy it, because I'm looking into the next 5, 10, okay. 20 years. I think having a perspective as the IPCC gave us, means that governments need to have a medium and long-term plan. But it does not mean that we have that much time to act. We need to start today. Each of us has a carbon footprint. We can start today revising our own carbon footprint, looking at the way you came here. Did you came walking? Did you came by, by bus? Hmm. Did you came by car? That makes a difference. How long? Have you taken to, to, to on the shower? That has an imprint. How much plastic, etc. Mm -hmm. These kind of okay. things of a daily uh, life need to change. I'm going to ask one better. last question of all of you. And we're going to do this lightning round because we have two minutes left before we open it up to audience questions. And this is, forgive me, I'm going to ask you that question that you get asked at every one of these talks. What is the one thing? What is the most important thing that we can do? I would like to ask you to imagine not just we as individuals, but what can we, either as an individual, as a community, as a city, as a country, as a generation, what is one thing that we can do at any of these levels? One thing. What I want to see from all of you is joining the student strikers and start joining us in our direct actions. One thing we I do. In addition to that, <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to get smart about going after all the financial institutions, from central banks to national banks to hedge funds to pension funds to foundations and high net worth individuals and so on. We need to direct money away from climate negative activities and direct it towards uh, climate positive activities. And that activism to shift the flow of finance will require each and every one of us, especially people who actually have capability and stake in financial institutions. Ambassador, you first and then Dr. Marvel. Well, as a diplomat, I hope that we will be able to maintain the doors very open at the United Nations, and we will be able to continue to work with the youth movement and other stakeholders. I think that's, that has made an, before and an after for the United Nations, honestly. As a person, I certainly hope that I would be able to live not only, as I tell you, for my children, but for my daily life, uh, 
less negative print than the one that my father and my grandfather left. Dr. Marvel, one thing at any of these levels. Don't vote for people who don't get it and organize mm -hmm. for people who do. <laughs> Um, I am going to, uh, I, I'm, I can't wait to hear what questions you all have. I will request that you ask a question, which ends with a question mark. Um, I will request that you keep it short, because we have so much to learn from this panel. Um, and please come to the mic and ask your question. Can I ask a question? Please. There are mics on both sides, by the way. Feel free. Oh, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. Um, my name is uh, Juan. I'm an architect at an urbanist, and I now work with an with a energy company that I believe in. But more importantly, I'm Puerto Rican. And I had an opportunity to work with FEMA after Maria, and I felt disgusted by their approach. Um, hoping to participate in the events of this week, I went to a gathering at the New School last Sunday, where they were gathering opinions, points of view. And one of the presenters was marveling about the wonderful job that the Army Corps of Engineers had done in clearing the ports in other parts of Puerto Rico. They did nothing for the people. And you had one Tell speaker question, after another. Please. I'll get to it. I'll get to my, my question very quickly. But it has to have this preview. Um, it's not about the, 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 the conclusion of the, of the people speaking there was that it's about more data collection, more governance. When I was in FEMA, there was a person that was putting the same data into 12 different formats and nothing was done, okay? And it's, so my statement is, it's not about governance, it's not about more data collection, it's about more self-empowerment, more self-governance, about going from macro systems to micro systems that develop people. Is there a I, question, sir? There is a question. What is going to be done by the, by the opposite of globalist, globalization, which is, Asymmetrical development. For me, from my experience, asymmetrical development has to be dealt with and any solution to climate. Because the first responders to any disaster are the people themselves. And let's they have to the, be empowered. Let's let the panelists answer. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I mean, if by asymmetrical development we mean the fact that the poor countries of the world actually subsidize the consumption patterns in rich countries of the world, and that poor people in all countries of the world subsidize the consumption patterns of the, the top 1% or top 5%. So I would say we never will going to solve the climate crisis without actually rethinking the whole model of development. So it requires more decentralized energy systems. For example, mm -hmm. the example you gave, mm -hmm. if we are concerned about taking rural people out of absolute energy poverty, you don't need to build big grids. You need small micro solar grids mm -hmm. for a village of 50 or 100 people. Mm -hmm. uh, but let me just say the main thing is, if you look at our response to the global financial crisis in 2008, it was all about system recovery, system protection, system maintenance. When what we should have learned is what we need is system innovation, system redesign, and system transformation. And that's what we need if you're going to prevent asymmetrical development, which is deeply embedded in the way the world operates. Mm -hmm. We have this amazing panel. Please, someone must have a question that I haven't asked. Hi. Uh, I am wondering a bit. Uh, I'm thinking about the narrative of focusing very much on 2040 and 2050. I belong to a project uh, of researchers, uh, um, companies, um, uh, civil society, which has been launching a report this week called the Exponential Roadmap, which very strongly advocates the halving of emissions till 2030. And I wonder, what is your best ideas for making us focus or in, in not only on the net zero and long term, but also more near term or mid term? Thank you. Well, Ambassador? Well, I, I will go back to my point that for me, the most important date is 2020, because not only is the most immediate, but it's also, according to the Paris Agreement, is the moment on which the member states need to come with enhancing this. If you take the level of commitment that has been, of which is on the table today, you will see that it is, at the maximum, one third of what is needed uh, to be done. 
So we need to, to scale up that drastically. And then you need to look into 2030, because by 2030, globally, emissions need to be reduced almost half, 45% according to the IPCC report. By 2030, are, that's... By 2030, yeah. uh, 45% mm -hmm. reduction. And this is uh, in order to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. The scientists will correct me if I'm wrong, but that's uh, the information we got from the IPCC. So I think those dates are useful to get this, the understanding of what needs to be done. But it's very misleading, because sometimes people say, well, we have 10 years to identify a solution, and we may be wasting very value, valuable time. Science is evolving, and new technologies could change those states. But today, I think we need to take it seriously and start is acting Is it possible what the, the audience member just asked, to have emissions by 2030, or do we need unicorn technology to do that? This is to, to, to maintain the temperature below 1.5. Mm -hmm. if, if we did the following things. One, the IPCC in October said if we are going to uh, engage in what some people call rewilding, which is one, million, uh, one trillion trees mm -hmm. to be planted urgently, the country of Ethiopia in 12 hours planted 398 million trees. If a poor country can do it, come on, don't tell me yeah. that we can't take one trillion, divide it, and so on. That's one action that we need to take urgently now, but a whole range of subsidiary actions need to be actually taken. And we need to be looking at reco recovery, as the, the term that you used, because, I mean, if you look at the Amazon right now, right, we need to look at how we actually engage in some measure of serious reforestation and so on. So unless we look at, I, I give you that as an example, but I am anxious that we have to do it in the next two to three years. These things need to go to scale. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we don't meet what the science told us in uh, October last year in terms of the 2030 sort of framework. Dr. Marvel, did you have something to say about the having emissions by 2030? Is it possible? Um, I mean, it's pos we create the possibilities. Um, I do think that a lot of the, the scenarios that we use to project, you know, staying under the 1.5 degree limit require the use of technologies that are not widely used right now, specifically something called BECS, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those scenarios, again, I, I am a physicist, I don't know anything about people. But a lot of those <laughs> scenarios seem very, very optimistic. Hmm. But optimism isn't the same as impossible. Hmm. Please. Hi. In a US presidential term that only lasts four years, do you believe, any of you believe, that major change can be made in the US, assuming that we have a president that cares? It's an interesting question. Is um, you know the U.S. is uh, historically the largest emitter. The U.S. currently is the only country in the world that has said it will pull out of the Paris Agreement. Though, in fact, it remains still in the Paris Agreement for another uh, another year. Um, we often hear that Americans are very divided on the issue of climate change, but the vast majority of Americans, in public opinion poll after poll, identify it as an important issue. Um, do you want to take a, a stab at this? You're not old enough to vote, but I think the question actually is really interesting to hear your perspective on. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I believe that any potential world leader who is looking after their country really does need to be protecting the future generations. And so what is so interesting about this youth movement is that we aren't looking at any sort of um, gaps between one party or the other. We're just uniting behind the science. And so this is one of the first times where we're not really making it um, political or polarizing. You mean among we, young people, it's not as partisan an issue as it is among grown-ups, older people. Exactly. We okay. youth like to stay nonpartisan because we want everyone involved. We don't really want to polarize. We want everyone to listen to the science instead of looking at one specific piece of legislation or looking at one specific party that's specific towards one country. 
a lot of the students what makes this movement so powerful is it's a global message. So we are really focusing on the global greenhouse gas emissions and the 100 companies um, that are contributing 70% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So we're really focusing on the systematic change that needs to happen in order to combat the climate crisis. Climate has come up as an issue in the uh, Democratic uh, contest already. Do you see, Dr. Marvel, um, a, a, a political tipping point at all? I don't know. Um, and the reason I don't know is because I don't really know anything about politics. But I, I also am just in a constant state of surprise and shock because I never would have imagined a giant youth movement. Hmm. Um, in 2016, at the presidential debates, there was not a single question asked about climate policy. And now, this year, CNN had a seven-hour town hall where they grilled all of the candidates on their climate policies. And three of my students asked questions in that town hall, actually, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. And so just the fact that all of the presidential candidates are on stage being grilled by extremely smart Columbia University graduate students about their climate policy. The Democratic the, presidential candidates. Yes. Yes. <laughs> are up there being grilled. What does that, that say was, to you? That was unimaginable to me. Mm -hmm. And that sort of makes me not trust my imagination. It makes me not feel like my imagination is expansive enough to hold the changes that might be coming in the future. So I don't mm -hmm. trust myself to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, we can take one more. Please, yeah. come. Okay. Yes. Um, hi. Thank you all so much for everything that you do. It's great hearing you. Um, my thought, as I think about some of these things, the run-up to um, the internet bubble bursting, everyone knew it was coming, but everybody wanted to make the last dime or dollar or what have you. Um, everybody knows this is coming, but nobody wants to be the last person to not make money off of it. How do we make continuing the status quo painful enough so that people stop? And then second question, nationalism, tribalism, how does it contribute to what you talked about, the change in, in thought? Well, let, let, me, let me start sharing something that happened today. Today I attended the, the first meeting in the morning. It was uh, at, the, at the WEF. And then I attended a meeting of the US Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I was talking to converters. I was quite surprised how serious the engagement is, is, is there. I don't know, but the many are, are coming. And I think they are very much aware of the risk of not being at the front. And we need to make sure that that continues to happen. And I use an example of one of the initiatives that I heard that the youth brought to the, to the summit. It's an application on a, for a cell phone, on which Alejandra can explain it better probably than me. With the application, you can check every product you consume. You can check how sustainable the company is. That threatens the private sector, because youth are consumers. We are all consumers, and we all care. So this kind of movement is what is going to make the difference, I think. In terms of the, the politics in general, not the politics of one country, the divide between developed and developing countries, if you look into the level of commitment of the poorest of the countries, the LDCs, they are bringing something on, on mitigation even though they have not contributed at all LDCs to the, to are the, the least, the least developed, developed countries, countries in the, in the world. In the Sorry world. for the acronyms. Uh, and they are, they are not only looking for funds for adaptation, they are also contributing. They, they They're sense, saying, we're going to cut our emissions. They, got, they right. promise that they will, they will get okay. to 100% renewables by 2050. This is quite impressive leadership. It shows that now there is a very good understanding among all countries, in all regions, about the necessity to act. And the differences between one and the other ones is on the sense of urgency and the capacity to get the necessary funding and the necessary technology. That's why the United Nations has a very important role to play, because we can identify opportunities and resources. And we need to facilitate implementation 
of commitments. It's not easy. There is a transition that is going to be necessary. There is a transition not only in terms of the time that it will take to move from one technology to the other, but also the social impact, the, 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 the situation of people involved into different activities. We're talking a, a change of the model of consumption. Kumi, quickly. Climate change constitutes an opportunity. Mm -hmm. We have lived in a world that has been divided for far too long, east, west, north, south, develop, developing, and so on. We either unite as a global community and recognize that this is a global challenge that doesn't recognize borders, mm -hmm. and we protect the future of all our children and their children. If we don't act with the urgency that the situation calls for, true, people in poor countries who have been least responsible will pay the first, as they are now, first and most brutal impact, but ultimately nobody is faced. Uh, nobody is secure. So let's use the challenge of climate change to build a different kind of global community that breaks down racism, breaks down xenophobia, mm -hmm. breaks down religious bigotry and so on. Because if we don't build that as part of the climate struggle, we don't create a substantially different world from the one that we live in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for, for listening. And thank you in advance for reading the climate coverage in the New York Times. Have a good night.